today on this holiday weekend, and we just thank you so much for coming. Looking forward to what the Lord is going to do in this house today. You know what? All we have to do is just be receptive to and open up our hearts and our minds to whatever He wants to do with us. Amen? He's your creator. He knows you better than you know yourself. So He knows exactly what you need in this moment. And He is here to do it. And we're just here to receive. Amen? So let's just stand. We're going to pray. Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your love to us. We thank you for creating us for such a time as this, Lord. And we know that we are all destined and have a purpose to be used by you, God, in whatever way you see fit. We just need to submit to that. And we know that through that, submitting, we will find peace. We will find hope. We will find joy. And we will know that we can be a light to you, to others, Lord. And we know through you and through your strength and your power and your name that nothing is impossible.
Let faith rise. Let faith be known as our strength, God. The faith that we have in you, Lord. And give us more, Lord. Strengthen our faith. Thank you.
with you for just a second. We're going to go back into that song in just a minute. But I want to thank you for coming to the house of the Lord today, this holiday weekend. A lot of people are traveling, a lot of people doing different things all about. But you made the choice to be in the house of the Lord today, and I'm so glad that you did. I'm looking forward to what God wants to do in this service. I'm looking forward to what He wants to do through us today. And I love to hear you sing. I've heard you begin to sing out. You know this song. You know it well. You know, faith is the essence of our belief system. If we don't believe in things that we cannot see, things that we know in our hearts, but it's hard to explain to someone else, we walk by faith, the Bible says, and not by sight. We know that things are going to happen that we haven't seen yet. And to act as though they already are is faith. I think about those things that happen with Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. I've been studying Jeremiah some. I've been studying about how troubled he was in his life. And he didn't live in a time that he had good news. He always had to tell the Israelites, look, you've gotten off track and this is going to be bad, but you've got to trust God through it all. Your nation is going to be taken over. We're going to be held captive. And they just didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear it. They said, no, no, not us. We're the chosen people of God. We won't be under some other ruler. No, and, and Jeremiah kept saying, we've got to turn back to the Lord. We've got to trust Him. He's got a plan that none of us have. And I think about Lamentations, which is basically Him lamenting and how sorrowful that book is. But then in chapter 3, about midway down, when Jeremiah is just lamenting before the Lord, he reminds himself of who he's serving. God asked him not to get married. God asked him not to have children because things were just going to be so desperate. He said, great is thy faithfulness. Your mercies are new every morning, Lord, and I'm going to trust in you. So I love this song because it talks about those of us with hardened hearts. It talks about those of us who are weak. It talks about those of us who are broken inside. Whatever it is this morning, God can strengthen us. He can revive us. He can heal us. He can deliver us. So would you stand back with me again? And let's just worship together in this song one more time. Let's ask Him to give us all faith. It's going to take faith to do what He's called us to do. Amen?
this morning. Your word says that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So Lord, I just pray that you would stir up hope in all of us today. All of us can use it in one area or another in our lives. And so Lord, those things that the enemy would try to make us trouble by this morning, those things that would weigh heavy on our heart, those things that we're concerned about, Lord, we just lift them up to you today. Lord, we want to, for those of us that are going to have a day off tomorrow, we want to enjoy that with light hearts and full of peace. And so, Lord, we just ask you to stir up hope in us. Your word says that hope doesn't disappoint. God, these things will remain faith, hope, and love. And Lord, we just want you to stir that hope today. And the evidence of things not seen is in your word, God, that you would use people that were most unlikely to be used. That you would heal people that society had forgotten. That you would deliver people that had no help but you. That you would strengthen people that were weak. That is who you are, God. When we're the weakest, you're the strongest. God, you always look for those of us who know we can't make it on our own so that we can be testaments to you of your strength, of your glory, and of your might. Lord, let all of us be testaments to you today. And may our prayer be, as the servant said to you, Lord, I believe, but I need you to help my unbelief. So Lord, those today that are struggling to believe that you're going to change their work, change their relationships, change those things that they need changed, God, those that are struggling to pay the time today, those that are struggling in body, mind, and spirit, we ask that you strengthen each and every one of us today. In the strong name of Jesus, I ask. Amen. Amen. Church, let's give him praise one more time. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. I'm Again, I'm thankful that you made the choice today on a holiday weekend to come and be with us and, and worship today. I'm looking forward to what God is going to do with us through this weekend. I hope all of you are going to get some time off tomorrow. And if I just depressed you and you're not, I pray that you'll enjoy your day off whenever it is tomorrow. I'm working tomorrow too. That's just one of those things I need to do. That I'm going to take that time and, and do some things that God's called me to do. But I'm glad you're here today. I want to welcome everybody by Facebook Live. I know that God is using that ministry mightily, our YouTube channel, our Facebook uh, page, and also our app that we have. So if you haven't downloaded our app, please go and get that. That's something you get information. You can do prayer requests there. You can download all the sermons from there or just listen to them on the app. It won't download the memory on your phone or use it up. I'm looking forward to our children learning about the Word of God on their level. We're about to dismiss them today. If you're a guest, we do have Children's Church for ages 4 through 12. We'd love to connect with you. If you are a guest today, there's a card in front of you that says new here. We'd love for you to fill that out. You can place it in one of these boxes here, or you can go back. We'd love to have you visit our Welcome Center today before you leave, and we'll give you a little folder that has some information about our church in it. And also, it has a little coupon in there for coffee or ice cream, maybe a sandwich. We're looking forward to what God is going to do through the word today that Dakota's going to bring us. But right now, I want to bless our tithes and offering. We do receive that. And God's led us to do it a little differently as well. These same boxes that I've mentioned, you can place it anytime you want to during the service. But I want uh, God to, to bless it and move it forward. So I'm going to bless it at this point. And let me just share a good praise report with you. We made our goal of giving $500 to the Mays Creek Church that is in Columbia. They're trying to remodel their uh, sanctuary, and it's a small congregation, an aging congregation. We're able to bring that and send that this week. So thank you. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for all that you do. God has called us to help other churches and help other ministries. I'm so thankful that you're responding to that call that he laid on your heart. So go ahead and give yourself an appreciation this morning. Amen. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, God, that you're able to meet our needs and meet it in abundance so that we can meet the needs of other churches and other ministries. Lord, we thank you for the for the $1,800 that we raised for Hope uh, Pregnancy Center, God. I'm just so thankful that you're laying these things on our heart, Lord, and you're multiplying what we're being able to do things here, Lord. You're going to cast vision this coming week, this next Sunday, about some things that we're going to do here. And Lord, we believe that you're going to open up the floodgates of heaven for that. 
Lord, I thank you for those that are tithing, those that are giving out of their offerings above their tithe. And I pray for those that are working through that and you're dealing with them today, Lord. I know that you're going to bless us all to meet not only our needs, but help us so we can meet the needs of others. Lord, be with our children today. Let them learn the word on their level. Let none of them leave here without knowing you today, God. Bless those that are working with them. And Lord, may our brief fellowship be sweet in Jesus' name. We're going to greet each other very quickly as our children go to Children's Church. We're going to have a few announcements, and then we're going to get the word of God. Amen.
um, as the church grew, um, things around here got um, really busy. And uh, so it got to be a little bit more than Pastor Don and I could do on our own. And I'm talking things that just keep things rolling around here. How many of you know, moms, that, you know, if you didn't go to the store every week, things would just kind of shut down at your house, right? Or not just moms, but anybody that has a household. Well, that's the same way for church. And um, to keep things rolling around here, we need some help. But not just in those things, but in ministry as well. And so God um, presented a special couple to us a year ago. And they were Dakota and Rebecca White. And um, I can honestly say that they've been a blessing to me. Because, um, you know, if you have children that are in the nursery, Rebecca is coordinating all that for you. And she's keeping those nurseries clean for you. Not just for you, but for the Lord. They are um, doing all those little things that if, if they weren't doing it, you would definitely notice. Every cup, every fork. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail, but paper towels and bathroom and other things that we use in the bathroom, all those things are purchased by them because they are hands and feet of Destiny Church. They keep things rolling for us. But besides all of that, they have a heart for the Lord and they have a heart to be used by the Lord. And so we have seen this heart in them and they love young people and they have given of their time. They've given of their resources. They've given up their creative talents and their ministry to minister to our young people. And they're working with a team of people that do the same. And so we're very, very thankful for them. And because it is their one-year anniversary, if you haven't gotten to know them, get to know them. They're precious. You're missing out. And um, so this is their one-year anniversary, and Dakota's going to minister to us and show his heart to us, what the Lord's put on his heart for us. But I'm telling you, they love you. And they love Destiny Church. But even above and beyond that, they love the Lord. And they are being used by them. So um, Pastor Don's going to come up and probably speak a little deep, deeper than I, I do. But um, we love you guys very much. If you have brought a gift, a card, or an offering for them, there is a box in the foyer that you can put that in or our offering boxes. Either way. Or you can hand it to them personally. I'm sure they won't mind. So um, we're excited about what um, today represents and what the Lord has done for us. Um, also on that note, we'd like to have lunch with them. So anybody that wants to have lunch in a fun menu, um, Dis and Dion, it's so fun to say, uh, is going to um, be hosting us after church today. If you would like to uh, take advantage of this, just a fun faith family meal, Dutch treat. Um, it's right after service today, and they are located, um, if you take a ride, they're located right behind Arby's um, in front of those new apartments that they've been building across the street from Wendy's. So easy to find. We'd love to have you eat with us today. Just going to be a fun, lighthearted time of fellowship, but also to honor um, Rebecca and Dakota. I do want to say a few things. I'm not going to take his time. I've been where he's been sitting before and go, Pastor, don't talk too long now. I'm ready to preach. I want to bring the word. So I'm not going to take too long. But I do want to share a little bit about them and a little bit about what they're doing and a little bit about what we're going to do going forward. So they've been here a year now. Their anniversary was, I think, Monday uh, of this week. They have been here a year with us, and that has flown by. I don't know about you, but it has for me. And with that time, they have uh, gotten up to speed on several things, and that's going to free uh, me up to do some visionary things and kind of move forward with other things that God is calling me to do. And without them, that would not be possible. And uh, just to tell you a little bit about Dakota and Rebecca and kind of Kind of casting some vision with you and kind of what they represent for us um you know dakota was was working at a very good job very good benefits and he felt the call of the ministry on his life and i met with him he really didn't know me and i really didn't know him but he believed in what we were trying to do and he left the job and took about a 50 percent pay cut and moved his family up here and which is consists of Rebecca right now, but still took that risk and moved 
Uh, other people knew me and knew about me, but he really didn't. And that said a lot right off the bat. And I knew he was working on those rail cars out in the heat, and he was a hard worker. And he has proven that to be that. But more than that, I want to talk to you about, really quickly, about what God is asking us to do going forward and their representation of that. He wants us to be fat, and he wants us to fill the gap, okay? So, I know that's not politically correct these days to be fat, but really that's what he wants us to do. Some of you have heard me say this before, faithful, available, and teachable. They represent every bit of that. They are faithful, their life really is beyond reproach. They are headed toward God and their integrity is unquestionable. They are faithful and they're available. And we talked about when he first got here, days off and kind of how we would work that out. He figured out within the first month there really are no days off in ministry. It's when we need it. When we are needed and when I need him, he's never balked. He's never questioned it. He's always been there. He's always been saying, I'll be right there. I'll be on my way. Never, ever has he ever even had an attitude about it when he got here. And he's teachable. Very teachable. Anything and everything I have to say, he wants to hear it and he applies it to his life. Now the new thing is the gap. Gap represents growth. He is willing to grow from the first time I got here and, and I gave him a book and I said, this is what you need to read. And I want you to read a chapter a week and we're going to meet once a week and discuss that. He was so hungry for that. He wanted that and and he started talking to me about, man, I, I wish I could share this with others. And I said, we'll start praying that we'll open the door for that. And so he's willing to grow and God's asking us to grow. I'm growing as a leader and a shepherd. God's asking me to grow as well. And also accountable. He's accountable to me. He's accountable to his wife. He's accountable to those he ministers to on Wednesday night. He doesn't mind that accountability. He embraces it. It's something that he wants in his life to make sure that when some people depend on him, He's actually there and he delivers, which is the last thing, which is production. He produces spiritual fruit, but also he produces anything I give to him. He does it. He is a production guy. He is driven. And I'm thankful for him today. And I know this word is in his heart. I know he's been looking to do it now for quite a while. And I see the net over here, so I'm going to leave the front row open so I don't get caught in the middle of that. And so... Would you let him know how much you appreciate him today, please, as he comes? Amen.
the leadership down. Everybody, y'all are phenomenal. And oh, we love you and we're praying for you and I hope that, that you're praying for us and we hope that you love us. Um, I know this sounds so weird and we're going to get it um, figured out, but it's no big deal, especially for a Sunday morning. It's no big deal to, for Pastor Don to have uh, somebody come up here. No, he's going to be accountable for every single word that is preached up here, every word that's said up here. So one day he's going to get to heaven and Jesus is going to be like, you remember that time that Dakota preached? That Sunday morning, yeah. I hope so. I hope that's a good conversation. I hope that's a good meeting, and um, I'm very, very excited to um, to preach this. So before I start, um, my title is "From Fishermen to Fishers of Men." It's a story of finding your identity. It's a story of finding your purpose. Uh, these men, uh, Peter and John thought they knew who they were and thought they knew who their life, what their life was going to be like. But they had no idea that who they thought they were always going to be was going to change into somebody they were always going to become. That they would change so dramatically. So we start off this story in Acts chapter 4. And a little bit that happened in Acts chapter 3 is that Peter and John are walking in. They come to this gate called the Beautiful. And at the bottom of this gate, there is a man, this beggar, who has been lame from birth. And he basically asked them if they have any change, if there's anything that they could spare, any money, any silver or gold. And basically Peter reaches down and says, silver and gold I have not, but what I do have, I give you. Rise in the name of Jesus, take your mat and walk. So this happens and all the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, they see this and they are the listener. They are so mad, they're aggravated because they thought that at the murder of Jesus they could change all of that. That when Jesus Christ was murdered, none of this stuff would happen anymore. But they found that even more things started happen, happening. More miracles. More salvations. People are now coming, not in the hundreds of tens, but in the thousands are coming to knowledge of Jesus. So Peter and John are arrested and thrown into jail because it was night that they spent an entire night in jail. And early the next morning they are placed before the scribes and the Pharisees, the Sadducees, Caiaphas, uh, Ananias, the high priest. And this is where the questioning begins. So starting in Acts chapter 4, verse 7 through 13, and then we're going to jump to 18 through 20. This is the Amplified Version. When they had put the men in front of them, they repeatedly asked what sort of power or in what name that is, by what kind of authority, did you do this healing? Then Peter, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, Members of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish High Court. If we are being put on trial today to interrogate us for a good deed done to a man to benefit a disabled man, as to how this man has been restored to health, let it be known and clearly understood by all of you and by all the people of Israel that in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you demand be crucified by the Romans and whom God raised from the dead, in this name, that is, by the authority and power of Jesus, this man stands here before you in good health. This Jesus is the stone which was despised and rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is no salvation in no one else, and there is no other name under heaven that has been given among people by which we must be saved. For God has provided the world no alternative for salvation. And get this. Now when the men of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high court, saw the confidence and the boldness of Peter and John and grasped the fact that they were uneducated, untrained, ordinary men, they were astounded and began to recognize that they had been with Jesus. Jumping over to verses 18 through 20. So they sent for them and commanded them not to speak as his representatives or teach at all in the name of Jesus using Him as their authority. But Peter and John replied to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you and obey you rather than God, you must be the judge for yourselves. For we, on our part, cannot stop telling people about what we have seen and what people have, what we have heard. So Peter and John now go from mere fishermen, mere fishermen, to telling these religious leaders that we can't go back to our old life. 
Not even if we wanted to. We've seen too much. We've heard too much. There is now something inside of us that we can't return. We can't go back to that old life even if we wanted to. There is so much available for us now. So, we are no longer fishermen. We can't just stop. We are fishers of men. We have found our new identity and purpose in Jesus. And that's the same Peter. The same Peter that was ashamed of Jesus by the campfire when the woman, the woman who couldn't do anything to him, he was ashamed and denied Jesus. And now he's before this Jewish court that could have him murdered just like they had Jesus murdered and he is unashamed and he is bold before them saying, you judge for yourselves what you will do but for me in my house basically, for me and my friend, for me and John, we can't stop saying what we have seen and heard. So let's look for 30 minutes, let's look at these two men, these two uneducated, untrained, Ordinary men. And let's start with uneducated. So, in the Jewish system, the first, when all the boys, they had to learn the Bible, basically. You had to go through a Bible training, and you were told that you had to memorize the first five books of the Bible. That you had to memorize them. Like you had to read them over and over and over again, set back before a priest, and you had to recite them. So, just imagine if you think our tests are hard. That's a tough thing. So you take the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, and you have to now memorize those things. And if at one point, if you did not complete your training, if you failed in a certain book, then you were considered uneducated in the Jewish law, uneducated in the Jewish religious standards, then you were now sent to a, like a lower paying job or just a regular job. If you completed all of them, you became a master, a teacher, a priest. We know that Jesus completed all of these because He taught in the temples. If he, was, if he did not complete these, He would have never been able to teach. Also, we know that He completed these because when He came, Peter referred to Him as Master, Teacher, understanding who He was. So, this is where we start. So, at the beginning of Luke chapter 5, Jesus is walking by the lake, okay? And he comes to the end, he comes to these men who are by their boats, they're cleaning their nests, and he begins to teach this large crowd that's following behind them. And the crowd has become so immense and much that they're now pressing against him, and he's either going into the water or he's just having to go through them. So he's looking for a way to, so he can get away from the people, so he can preach from a distance. And he sees these men over here, and they're cleaning their nests after a long, unsuccessful night of fishing. And he says, excuse me, sir, is this your boat? Yes, it's my boat. Do uh, you mind if I can get in it and we can be put out a little from the shore so I can teach these people? So now Jesus is in Peter's boat. He's away from the crowd. He's able to communicate everything he needs to now. And water is a natural amplifier. So his voice is now louder and is helping him to teach. So we start in Luke 5 and these uh, verses are not up there. When they had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Simon, who is Peter, who later changed his name to Peter, put out into deep water and, let's, and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So, all of Peter's experience and all of Peter's knowledge in fishing, he was a fisherman, all of his knowledge, all of his knowledge and experience told him this will never work. Okay? This will never work. But nevertheless, we will try your way. But Peter could have said something like this. Think about this. Peter could have said, Jesus, I know I am not educated in the things that you are. But I've done this my whole life. I've done this my whole life. We have fished all night and caught nothing. And throwing this net in now will not change anything. You just saw me cleaning this net and it is now clean. I am tired. I am dirty. I am stinky. I'm hungry. We have no fish to eat, Jesus. We've caught nothing. You think that I want to stay here? No, I want to go 
home. Maybe I want to see my wife. Maybe I want to see my kids. I don't want to be here right now. Okay? Maybe he could have said that. What if he would have said that? What if Peter allowed his pride to get in between Jesus' suggestion and correction? Okay? What if he would have allowed that? What would have happened to Peter? Would he have ever became a disciple? Would he ever become a fisher of men? He would have fished for fish his whole life. If he allowed an insult to come in. If he would have allowed Jesus' suggestion to become an insult to him. Is there anybody in here who is skilled in a certain kind of craft? That they know something about, like for me, when I was working on rail cars, I could weld and I, uh, I did all the valve work. I pressured the cars up and I... Uh, tested all the valves on them. Um, so that was something that I was good at. That was something I learned about. That was something that I knew all the ins and outs. Because if not, I would have died doing it. Okay? I had to know exact pressures. I had to know exact things about those. And if somebody would have came up there the first day on the job and said, you're not doing that right. You don't know what you're doing. How would you feel? You don't know me. You don't know what you can die with. Stop. You're, take your suggestion and go Okay, I know what I'm doing. And that's Peter. That could have been Peter. That's, that's saying, no, I've been fishing my whole life. I know I'm not educated like you, but I know what I'm talking about. So what if he took those nets and he just grabbed them and he said, you're not going to use these. These are my nets. This is, this is who I am. This is my identity. This is my purpose. You, you're, I'm not going to use these for what you want. These nets were just now clean. I need these nets. I need to wash them and cleanse them. If not, they're going to get destroyed. Okay? But the breaking of those nets started a journey for Peter into who he was always supposed to be. Without the breaking of these nets, without the miracle that happened, that he could have never become who he was. So... Peter had to be broken. His pride had to be broken. His identity needed to be broken. And get this. That you can't prove yourself to God. God's identity proves you. Okay? But many times we get so caught up in trying to prove ourselves to man and to God. And Peter fished all night in his own might and caught nothing. All night long, he did it under his own power. And what does this prove? Did that prove that Peter was a bad fisherman? No. He had a rough night. He had a sorrowful night. Maybe he was going through a hard season of his life. But this net, okay, the net is the gateway to that miracle. Without that net there, the miracle couldn't have happened. No, Jesus could have just like made a net real quick or something. I don't know. But the net was the gateway to that miracle. Okay? So what he was saying was, Peter, I want you to throw that net out. Jesus, I fished all night long. This nothing is going to be different. And Jesus said, no, you fished all night. But now it's my turn to fish. And many times we take this net and we are so sure of ourselves and the word that God gave us. And we throw that net out and we pull it back all night long. Nothing. And maybe there's a season of our life that we're constantly throwing that net out. And you know the promises of God. You know that He is faithful. You know that He said He was going to come through. But still, you're catching nothing. And you're getting discouraged. You're starting to doubt God. And you're like, God, why is this happening? Why am I not catching anything? But it wasn't that, that Peter was a bad fisherman. He was just having a rough night. And that there are seasons that we go through that we constantly throw this out. But we have to remind ourselves that it's nothing that we can do. It's not our worth or not us who can prove ourselves. But God proves us. It was simply not the right time for that miracle to happen. It was simply not the right time. And God was setting Himself up and setting Peter up so that He could come and prove the miracle. When He knew there was no fish in that water at that time. But many times we get so weary throwing out, not catching anything. But we know that don't become weary and well-doing for at the proper time, 
you're going to reap a harvest. But if we hold on to our promise for so long, not letting God do it, thinking, I can fix this, thinking, I broke it myself, and I can fix it myself. I have to get myself right before I come to God. I have to do these things before I come to God because I broke this myself, and now I need to fix it. So we hold on to it, thinking we can change things when really we can't. That we can't prove ourselves to anybody, not man or God. God's identity proves us. And He always proves to be faithful. But Peter's pride had to be broken. Peter's pride had to be broken. So education is great. It is. And yes, pursue education by all means. But understand this. Jesus is not looking for somebody who is educated. He is not looking for somebody who has a degree. He is not looking for somebody who passed all their tests. He is looking for somebody who is broken before Him. He is looking for somebody who can be pliable in His hands. He is looking for somebody whose pride has been stripped away and He can now mold their hearts. Peter was a rough fisherman, a man who was probably set in his ways. Probably we know some people like that. But by, by a miracle, he changed Peter's heart. And Peter falls on his knees begging for mercy. And his identity is not changed there. But he knows there is more to life. It's follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. Not follow me and you are a fisher of men. Follow me and you will become a fisher of men. So the next thing we're going to look at is untrained. The word says they looked at these men and saw that they were uneducated and untrained. So to find our uneducation, uneducated, whatever, I just messed that all up, okay? Your identity doesn't come from training or knowing who you are. It comes from knowing who He is. And to find a man who is untrained in battle, untrained in these things, we go and look at David. And David was a man after God's own heart, but he was not a warrior. Okay? He was a shepherd boy. He was a runt. He was the smallest, the youngest of all his brothers. And this is where God uses him. So Samuel was looking across the countryside for the new king of Israel. And he comes and he tells David's father, line up all your boys so I can examine them, so I can see if these are the ones that God has for them. So he pulls out all his, his best best young men and he says, no, not this one, not this one, not this one. Do you have any more sons? He's like, well, these are the best I've got. No, do you have any more sons? Okay? And he says, yes, I, I do. I have one more son. That is a, it's the youngest of the group. He's the smallest. He's out there with you. He's out there with you. you get, but you don't want him, Okay? You want one of these. These are my best boys. Okay? He says, no, go get that. So David comes and so enough, he is now the king of Israel. He has anointed the next king of Israel. So, one day, Israel is in a battle. And this Philistine, this giant, is taunting them every single day. And David's father says, you know what, go take this food, take this bread, go out to your brothers, they need food. So he goes out there and he, he finds this army destroyed. He finds these people hurt. And they're like, what's going on? Well, this guy keeps mocking us and no one will fight him. It's like, well, what is he saying? Who is he? Why is he here? And after figuring all that out, he says, I can fight. I can do it. And everybody should know you can't fight him. You can't do that. You're not even a, a fighter. You're not a warrior. You're not trained to do this. Okay? So he keeps talking. And Saul overhears him, the king of Israel. He says, bring this boy to me. Okay, so the giant is saying, you, you send a guy out, I'm going to fight him, I'm going to kill him. Nobody wants to go. The people who are trained for battle are not doing battle. The people who are trained for this very thing are not doing anything. So Saul sends, sends for this boy. He gets him and he says, he says look, you, you can't. Why are you saying these things? You're sending false hope through the camp. You can't do this. Basically, David is like, you do not know me. First of all. Second of all, when a bear came up, I killed that bear. When the, when the lion came up, I killed the lion. Okay? I can defend these people. This listening is not going to be any different than a lion or a bear. So Saul says, okay, whatever. 
We'll send you out to you. So Saul first puts his armor on David. Basically, David looked like a king and had the identity of a king. But one, it was not his identity and it was not God's way. That there are people, some people in the Bible, and there's people here that we try to, when it looks like our identity isn't good enough, our purpose isn't good enough, the way we have been our whole life isn't good enough to do the things that God has called us to do, we start to try to become someone else. And we start to put on other people's identity or find a way to help God with His stuff. But it's not God's way, just like Abraham. How he tried to, when he didn't see the promise coming, he tried through another route to bring the promises of God, to try to help him. That many times we are asked to do something great for God, and we look at our own faults and our failures in our identity, so we try to become somebody that we're not. That God could use me if I was better in this. That God could use me if a bank account was like this. God could use me more if I was married, if I wasn't divorced. God could use me if this didn't happen, if that happened. I just wish that God could use me, but, but nothing. So we try to help God by trying to be better than we are when it was never about us in the first place, when we could never prove our worth in the first place, but we try to help Him. But it is always and will always be about Him. It's never about us. That my life, my looks, my life, my talents, my past, my marriage, my skills, my struggles, the best that I have will never do because it doesn't rely on me. It relies on Him. It doesn't rely on what I have to say or what I am doing in my life. It relies on what He is going to do through me. But if we do not understand that and not grasp that, then we'll try our whole life to be somebody and to do things that we could never do on our own. So David steps out and he steps to Saul and he says that this armor, I'm not trained for this armor. I can't wear this armor. I'm too small. You're too big. This will not work. So he steps out of Saul's armor. But he understands that a shepherd boy cannot defeat a giant. A shepherd boy, the run of a family, the, the son who was forgotten by his father cannot defeat this army. So I have to also step out of who I am. I have to step out of the king's identity, I have to step out of my identity, and I have to put on God's identity. I have to walk in His victory. I have to walk in His power. That if I walk in who God is, then I can become, I can have the benefits of that. If I walk in God's identity, which is victory, then I can have victory. If I walk in power, then I can have power. If I walk in, in step with God, knowing that it's not about Him, knowing that it's all about Him, then how can I lose? How can I be put down? Because God goes before me. 1 Corinthians 2, 1-5 says, and this is Paul speaking, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, that when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you in the testimony about God, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling, and my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith not, may not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. So David said to that Philistine, that you come at me with swords and spears and javelins, but I come at you with the power of the Lord God Almighty, the armies of Israel. I don't come at you with persuasive words or human wisdom. I don't come at you with great training. I come at you in the name of Jesus. And that is all that was needed. That's all that was needed to fight Him. But many times we get so caught up on what we don't have and the things that we're trying to become that we don't understand God can use us in the midst of who we are right now. Amen. And that He would rather do that. And you can accomplish more by just giving Him your identity so He can make the purposes clear to you what's he, what He wants to do. But many times we try to be everything at once. So David goes from being a runt, a shepherd boy, a forgotten son, to being anointed by Samuel, slaying a giant and becoming a king. So training is great. And yes, mastering your craft is great. But God is not looking for people who are trained to do certain things, okay? These men were trained to do battle and they could not find it in themselves to do it. They were fearful, trembling. And when a shepherd boy, with his only advantage was he knew how to sling the stone and he knew how to trust God, he took down that giant. He took down that person when the people who were trained for him couldn't. 
So David was fat. Like Pastor Don talked about David was fat. So F A T, faithful, available, and teachable. He was faithful in the field of what God has given him. He was teachable. He was faithful in the field. He was available in the attack. He was available when the Philistines came and nobody would find us. He was available then and he was teachable in his troubles. But David had a life of ups and downs and he did some horrible things. But with Nathan, he was teachable when God came and corrected him. If we are going to go beyond, if we are going to have a life that moves the city, that moves this church, moves your family or your household, then you have to be broken first and you have to be available Faithful, available, and teachable. Okay? You have to be faithful, available, and teachable. You can't let a suggestion or a correction come at you and you're hurt or you're taken, taken insult by it. That there are people in your life, whether here or at work or in your family, that are trying their best to pour into you when they see things that are in you that should be pulled out. But it's a painful process to become better than we are. It's painful and it hurts, but the end result is so much better. We have to be able to take correction and suggestions from those who are no more than us. And finally, we look at unordinary. And it says, Now when the men of the Sanhedrin saw the confidence and the boldness of Peter and John and grasped the fact that they were uneducated, untrained, ordinary men, they were astounded and began to recognize that they, were with Jesus, they had been with Jesus. So they saw that they were uneducated, untrained men. But they were far from ordinary men. They were far from ordinary people. They were imitators of Christ. The very things that they saw Him do in the streets, he was, they were now doing. He saw them heal. He saw the girl race to life. He saw the blind see. And they said, this beggar, this lame man is no different. That if Christ did these things, then I can now walk in these things. And that is true for us today, even now. So they were imitators of Christ. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ has also loved us and given Himself for us an offering and a sweet-smelling sacrifice to God. So when Jesus was anointed, that bottle of oil was poured over His head, over His feet. Anything in that room smelled now like Jesus. Whoever was in that room smelled like Jesus. His disciples were always close to Him, always pressed up against Him. They probably smelled like Jesus. Those He healed, those He touched, they probably smelled like Jesus. So do you smell like Jesus? And smell can do three things. He can do many things, but these are three things I want to talk about. Smell can remind you of past events. Smell can bring emotions. And smell can make you hungry in your mouth, water. So when people see you walking in the streets and they see you helping people, do you act like Christ? Do you walk like Christ? Do you talk like Him? Is His aroma on you constantly? Do people smell Jesus off of your actions? Do people look at you and they say, that is Jesus. That is somebody who walks and talks like Jesus. And that aroma that's on you that aroma of Jesus will naturally make them thirsty for the well that never runs dry. It will naturally make them hungry for the bread of life. It will naturally bring them to you, be attracted to what you have. What do you have that is not that I don't? How are you able to be happy in this situation? How are you able to not be depressed when all these things are happening? How are you able to walk this walk? Because if I was in that situation, I would fall and fail. How are you able to do this? And people will despise you. And some people will even hate you because you just look like Jesus. But what they are really saying deep down inside them is please be real. Please be different than what I've always seen. Please be different than my friends who tried to accept Jesus and they walked away. Please be different. Please be more. Please show me that this life is, being, is able to be lived. This Christian life is able to be lived because I need and I want it, but I think it's there because no one else has walked this walk. No one else has talked this talk, but you look different. And I'm going to give you a hard time and I'm going to really, really push you. Please don't give up. Because I need this to be real in my life. I need you to show me that this is more that's in this bottle, that there is more that's in this 
thing that I'm pursuing, producing, and there's more in this lifestyle or this relationship than what I'm doing. So if the praise team could come, I told you we're going, I told you 30 minutes, we're going to be quick. So it says that they took note that they had been with Jesus. Notice the past tense in that. So have you spent so much time with Jesus that you act like Him, you talk like Him, or even you smell, you even you smell like Him? Does His aroma follow you around, the aroma of healing, the aroma of forgiveness, the aroma of love? Does it follow you? No doubt these were, these were ordinary men in the eyes of men. But to God they were ordinary. In the eyes of God they were broken, available, faithful, teachable. And that the way these uneducated, untrained, ordinary men, the way they could recognize that they had been with Jesus is because they still were with Jesus. That in Acts 2, as Pentecost came and the Holy Spirit fell on them, Jesus was now inside them. And that they took Him now everywhere. So if we are going to say that we have Jesus inside of us, and this is me speaking to myself. Why am I getting so mad at all? Why am I getting so mad driving when people cut me off or flip me off? Why is there something in me that coils and gets so aggravated with people that, don't, that I don't agree with? If that Holy Spirit's inside of me, if Jesus is with me, then I should be producing the aroma of Christ everywhere I go. So Peter goes from being ashamed of Jesus by the campfire to being unashamed of Him before the men. From a denier to a proclaimer, from a fisherman to a fisher of men, that Peter and John step into their new identity, that which they were always meant to become. Who they thought they would always be to who they never could have imagined was possible in Christ. That Jesus paid the ultimate price for us to have a relationship with the Father not as stepchildren, not as orphans, but as sons. But there are people in here, and there's hundreds of people watching, and there are thousands of people out there that are walking around like orphans or stepchildren, like a forgotten son, like David, when God has called you to so much more, and He has called you by name. So you are a son, you are a daughter. Come on. If everybody can stand, this is the last, last thing I want to say. On January 1st, 1863, Abraham Lincoln signed to effect what would be known as the Emancipation Proclamation. What this Emancipation Proclamation was, was a, a law that is going out before the country that all slaves, regardless of color, the largest regardless of age, are now free. And this is what that said. It said, All persons held as slaves shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. So now, by the law, a dark history has been closed to this nation, and a new life, a new identity comes forth with this Emancipation Proclamation. But do you know what happened? When the slaves found out about this, they went to their slave owners, their masters, and said, Did you hear about this? And the slave owner said, Yes, I did. And that is not true. Do you really think it would be that easy for you to be free? Do you really think all this could just stop by one signature, by one piece of paper? Do you think this is too good to be true? And many, many, Slaves believed their masters that this is just too good to be true, even though the law said that they were free. And they stayed in bondage for two to three more years as free men. And there are people in here, and there's been times in my life where I have been a bondage to sin, a bondage in bondage, and a slave to my choices and my lifestyle when I was free the whole time that I was sitting there because the only thing I knew was bondage. The only thing I knew was to fail. The only thing I knew was to compromise. So when this, the chains came off, I still stayed in that position. 
Because I didn't know my true identity. I didn't know my purposes. I didn't know my new identity in Christ that is free. So I stayed in that position thinking that I was in this. When really Jesus Christ said I was free. And that he who sent the Son sets free is free indeed. So I ask you this morning that you would ponder on it throughout the day and tonight. That am I really living the life that God has destined me to live? Not the life that others want me to live. Not the life that I'm supposed to live by the standards of this country or standards by what you grew up with. But am I walking the walk that Christ wants me to do? walk? Am I living to my full potential? Am I broken before Him? Am I faithful? Am I available? Am I teachable? Do I smell like Christ? And if that answer is no, what are you waiting on? What do you have to lose from a life sold out to Jesus? Not a life pursuing events, not a life pursuing uh, services, but a life pursuing Jesus. Where you smell like Him, you look like Him, you act like Him, and people can see Jesus on you. If we want to go beyond to where God has always destined for us to be, then we have to understand that where we are now is not good enough. And that He is calling us further. He is calling us higher. And I ask if that is you, and you desire to go further, if you desire to be more, if you desire for that old identity to be stripped off of you, then to make it right this morning. If you want prayer, can come to this middle pastor Don and me will be waiting right here if you need prayer prayer by yourself you can go to these altars by the side and you can pray I will give to you my name. 
Love you guys. 